fun. Let me have your attention. We're going to convene this meeting of the Economic Development Committee. Thank you for your attendance. I am joined by my colleagues, Nuri Martinez and Paul Kikorian. Um, and without objection, uh, we will take items uh, one through seven on consent. These are um, reappointments and appointment. Um, let me just be a little more formal here. We're waiting for another member before we, before we quorumize it, so we'll, uh, we'll hold off on that one. Um, let's, uh, let's have item, do we have any, any cards? Uh, we, have, we have cards on item number eight. Okay, let's, uh, right, let's read, uh, would you call number eight, please? Okay. Item eight. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Chief. Item number eight. Okay. Item number item number eight is the chief legislative analyst report relative to an economic development incentive policy for hotel development. Okay, we got some cards. John Howland, Central Cities, followed by Nicole. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members. I'm John Howland with the Central City Association. Uh, CCA wants to thank the city for realizing that it needs a comprehensive citywide program to incentivize building much needed hotel rooms in Los Angeles. The current ad hoc process of negotiating hotel development incentives is cumbersome, time consuming, and fails to give developers an understanding of what the city can and cannot provide uh, before they begin to try to finance a project. CCA supports the approach to standardize the hotel incentive program, and we agree with many of the recommendations put forth by the CLA. With only a few days to discuss this proposal uh, with our members and with other groups, we haven't had much opportunity, but um, we are supporting using the uh, BGIF or BGIF standards as a starting point, and that these recommendations, but we do ask that these recommendations not be set in stone. We, uh, we also believe that you must give teeth to these incentives in order to attract the large hotels that you want next to the convention center. As I was discussing with one of the nominees for the convention center authority, we need uh, much hotels are, and hotel rooms are vitally necessary to grow the convention center, and in particular, a large anchor uh, hotel. So building hotels the size the city wants next to the convention center is costly and it doesn't work financially. Um, and these are true incentives that will encourage the development that the city wants. Downtown, in particular, is becoming prohibitively expensive to build in. Hotels are very price sensitive, and in order to build the number of rooms that are needed near the convention center, flexibility in the incentives and the ability of the city council and city staff to go beyond the BGIF standards may be necessary. And this is, uh, as I said, especially true of a convention center anchor style hotel. So please don't shut the door to possible development by making these as far as the city council and the city staff can go with incentives. Uh, we want to applaud you for um, doing this. We support it, and we thank you. Thank you. Nicole? Good afternoon. Nicole Shahanian with the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. Um, we also want to stand by C with CCA's remarks, and thank you very much for taking this on. We appreciate the city's efforts to attract new hotels and think that this is definitely a good starting point. However, as the top tourist destination in the city, we are disappointed that this package is unlikely to benefit Hollywood as written. Of the 12 hotels now proposed in the Hollywood area, only one is greater than 200 rooms. So the 300-room threshold is really too high for the types of buildings that we're looking at attracting in Hollywood. Um, we continue to urge the council to incentivize hotel development at rooms greater than 200 <clears throat> as the threshold. Almost all eligible adaptive reuse buildings in Hollywood have already been converted for other uses. The few hotels we have that are greater than 150 rooms are already three star or greater. Um, so we ask that the city craft a plan that will realistically encourage development in the Hollywood area as well as throughout the city. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Any other uh, comments? <clears throat> Let's uh, ask uh, staff to come up. Uh, you see we have EDD here, the CLA's here, and the gang's all here. <laughs> uh, we are going to um, continue this uh, to the next meeting, but why don't you give us an overview of what's being presented and uh, how it differs, perhaps, from what we've done in the past. Um, yes, John Wickham with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. Uh, the last two times I reported on this, we uh, were following down a particular path that included some, frankly, some complicated elements here regarding the creation of hotel zones and different incentive amounts in each of those zones. And on reflection, based on, after considering a number of the questions that came from the committee members, um, we went back and we looked at this question again and found that there might be some, there might have been some preconceptions or misconceptions starting with the original motion and, and, the, and following through to our first two reports. Um, basically, the hotel policy that we've been, we've been following from the very beginning has been the structure of the Big If policy that was adopted by the Council in 1998. And that policy outlines some procedures for evaluating the financial need of a project, determining how much funding might be available for a project, et cetera, et cetera. We went back, looked at that, and realized we have been following, we have an, basically an ad hoc hotel policy based on the big if uh, policy elements and it was appropriate actually to you continue using that as our structure and to simplify the program um, so instead of having individual zones we apply the simple 50 percent of net new revenue uh, site-specific net new revenue across the city in all areas as you remember from the data the city of los angeles is as a whole falling far behind in the development of hotel rooms. It's um, staggering how far we are actually compared to other cities. And, you know, having zones that have higher amount of um, subsidy and some that are lesser might restrict the opportunity to develop new hotels. And since that's what we're trying to do, let's apply the 50% citywide as we do with the big if policy on other economic development projects. So the first effort was to simplify that. Um, the, there were a number of requests by, the com by committee members related to other incentives. We looked at those and it was, uh, we had some concerns that they would not be viable. For example, waiving the TFAR, a, a component of the TFAR fee. Um, it's, the code does not allow us to waive the TFAR fee at all, so it would require an amendment to the, um, to the law in order to allow, even allow a waiver of such type. And um, the, um, that has a, a cost impl impl implication for the general fund, and there were significant issues related to that. In addition, there are already considerations for changes to T the TFAR program, and so our our thought was it's, it's prudent at this point to wait on considering any changes to the TFAR ordinance um, as an incentive. And then there was an additional proposal that would have provided more than 50% of net new revenue um, to incentivize a hotel. And our office would, uh, would not recommend that to you. The idea with the 50% net new revenue threshold is that the city general fund benefits and the developer benefits and the city gets a project that is important for the city. When a new project like that comes in, there are, there are you know, a cost that the city incurs on a long-term basis in terms of providing city services, public safety in particular, and it's important that we grow the, the city general fund at the same time that we're helping with projects like this. And so our office would not recommend increasing that threshold beyond 50% of site-specific net new revenue. So those, those are the key elements here. One of, the, one of the helpful changes I think we have is that we no longer um, use the community taxing district as the vehicle to provide subsidy to a development. We can use a contractual um, arrangement through um, with conditional obligations. And 
by doing that again, we're simplifying the way the subsidy is provided to the developer, and we're able to, again, stick to the simple 50% of net new revenue policy. And um, in some cases, that will provide a little bit uh, more subsidy um, subvention available to the developer that we were not able to provide before. Thank you. Well, certainly, um, um, I think there was the desire of the committee that it be simplified, the process be a little more simple, and I think you've, you've done that. Still have a little tweaking to do, uh, and so we're going to um, we're going to continue this until March the 10th. Uh, I just got one quick question, though, uh, and, and my colleagues may have a couple of questions before we dispense with it. Uh, but how do we determine the fee, the, the the fee that the developer will pay uh, for processing the form? Is it a flat amount or some percentage of the total, or how is that uh, going to be determined? Which fee is that? There, the fee for the, uh, the cover costs associated with the analysis. Oh, um, that's, yeah. Um, in the past, we've um, provided uh, a, basically 100, we've asked for, requested 100000 or $200,000, depending on the size of the project. And um, we accept a certain amount, we conduct a study, and anything that's remaining, we refund to the developer at the end of the day. Um, in the past, our studies have come in at about sixty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000. Um, over time, I, we expect that that will probably go up um, just as a course of, you know, costs. And you're also proposing that EWDD uh, create a, a list of uh, eligible firms so that uh, save a little time at least in yeah that will actually out. shorten you know if we need to do a competitive rfp process for every consultant that adds several months in in the waiting time in order to conduct the study so if we had a list of consultants who were able to do the economic analyses on hotels specifically we would be able to go to the list and very quickly find a consultant and bring them in to do the work that would simplify it. mr Corian. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate having the additional time to kind of dig into this a little bit more, and I'm sure there will be a lot more we're going to want to talk about when it comes back. But just to the one point that uh, Ms. Shahinian raised uh, regarding the impact on Hollywood, I get the, the value of having a uniform policy across the city when it comes to the cap, the 50% cap. But I wonder if there might not be some advantage in having variations in different parts of the city as to eligibility, um, room number eligibility specifically. And just off the top of my head, in, in, she raised the examples of Hollywood. In my district, and I'm glad Mr. Overham is here, because in my district we're competing with hotels that are going to be built in Burbank, uh, around the Burbank Airport, for example. And um, I want those hotels built on my side of the border and not theirs because I want that. Even at 50 percent TOT, I'm going to get it. I want to get that. So, but none of those hotels are going to be 300 rooms. None of them are even going to be 150 rooms. They're going to be the smaller hotels. So is there some, some way that we can incentivize that kind of new construction and renovation? Conversely, um, to Mr. Howland's point, the city is in extraordinary need of very large anchor hotels around the convention center. So um, in that case, the, we, we certainly want to focus on the much larger hotels. And I, I get that you want to have a very high room rate threshold there because you don't want to subsidize hotels that aren't a, aren't serving that need, and B, are probably going to be locating there even without the uh, subsidy, if you will, or the, the incentive because of of the location. So you want to set a high threshold. So I, I can see having a uniform policy as to the benefit, but I think it's worth looking into whether eligibility requirements might vary depending upon the needs of particular communities. So there are a couple of things. Um, when I was hearing the comments on Hollywood, the thought occurred to me, and I, I would turn to the planning department for assistance on this, we don't need to do that now, but it, um, on consideration. Um, the key factor there is construction type on new construction. If you're building a wood frame construction, it's a pretty cheap construction type. You're only going up five or six stories, right? And 
you, you're, you're, the need for subsidy is going to be much lower. If you're building a tall building, you're going to be using steel, you're going to be using much more costly construction types. And my expectation is that in Hollywood, they're going to be, have smaller lots, they're going to be going taller, they're probably going to be using steel, and their construction costs are going to be higher, even if they're doing a hotel that's 200 or 250 rooms. So it may be that we can, for certain areas, um, base it more on construction type as opposed to as a, as a factor in the number of rooms. Um, because that, that really is the reason we're at the 300, thresh, 300 room threshold on the policy to begin with is that up to 300 rooms, you're probably going to be doing wood frame construction and it's just not as expensive. Um, there are provisions in the big of policy that would pass pass along over here that do create some flexibility um, for the council in consideration of the application and whether the subsidy can be provided and the amount of the subsidy. Um, to date, we have not gone over the 50% threshold on any project, whether it's a commercial project or, you know, or retail, et cetera, a hotel. But that option is available for the council to consider at a later date, and I don't think you would instruct us to ignore an application for a good project that means something important for the city's policies. Yeah, no, I, I'm not even suggesting the going over the 50 percent, and and the the construction cost um, is relevant, but it's also relevant to whether an incentive is necessary, whether yeah. there's going to be a shortfall uh, that that needs to to be made up for by an incentive anyway. So that's already yeah. sort of baked into having an incentive policy. Um, what I'm getting at is just on the eligibility. Might the eligibility thresholds be lowered in some places where the, that's yeah. we're competing in a smaller market than convention yeah. center anchor hotels? And, and that's why I thought you don't need to answer. Yeah. I'm just I'm just want to raise the issue because it's coming back. That's something yeah. that I'm going to want to look at. Great. Any other questions, members? Okay, without objection, we will. Uh, we will continue this to March the 10th. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. We've been joined by uh, colleagues Gil Cedillo and uh, Paul Cacor I'm sorry, Paul Coretz. Uh, members with no objection, I'm going to uh, move on consent. Item, items one through seven. Um, item one is the uh, appointment of Stella Mayor Jan to the Convention Center Board of Commissioners. Two is the appointment of uh, Ingrid Hutt to the Convention Center and Exhibition Authority Commission. Uh, three, the reappointment of Mr. Keith Martin to the Convention Center Exhibition Authority Commission. Uh, four, the uh, reappointment of uh, Martin Cooper to the Convention Center Exhibition Authority Commission. Item five, the reappointment of Mr. Dennis Hernandez to the Convention Center and Exhibition Authority Commission, and uh, item six, uh, the reappointment of Cheryl Turner to the Convention Center and Exhibition Authority Commission, uh, and uh, item uh, six, I'm sorry, item six, item seven, uh, the reappointment of Mr. Courtney Room to the Convention Center and Exhibition Authority Commission. Uh, if there are no objections, that will be the order. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Congratulations. Thank you, Commissioners. <laughs> that was a tough one. See you in Council soon. All right. Let's uh, move on then to item number nine. Okay. Item number nine is discussion of the Los Angeles Department of Convention and Tourism Development white paper, The Future of the Los Angeles Convention Center. Okay, we have Mr. Bud Overham himself. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the, of the committee, I'm Bud Overham, Executive Director of the Conventions and Tourism Development Department, uh, formerly of Burbank, and I want to see all these hotels built on, <laughs> built on our side of the city limits also. Let me share that, that uh, commitment to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come on uh, your agenda today. I have left for your reading pleasure a copy of a white paper that we produced last month um, and uh, you'll have time to read it, uh, but I just want to take a few minutes today to walk through some of the points that I particularly want to draw to your attention as you are reading it. Uh, of course, all of us want 
Farmers Field and the NFL Stadium. That that is our, our first choice, and we colloquially refer to that as Plan A. And we hope that that happens. Uh, AEG now is under a new clock; has a deadline till April 17th uh, to to cause that to happen. Uh, uh, or uh, this committee uh, and the council, in its wisdom, uh, directed staff to put together a Plan B. What are we going to do if that doesn't happen? Uh, and uh, with this report in front of you today, uh, talks a little bit about that. Uh, talks a lot about that, actually. Uh, so what all I wanted to do was, was hit some of the highlights. Um, let me first of all say that a lot of cities build convention centers in hopes of making their city a, a, a bigger and better city. Uh, and I think sometimes they take a small white elephant and turn it into a big white elephant because their city doesn't have the underlying fundamental economic wherewithal to support an even bigger convention center. So I think I think doing convention centers at all is a tricky business and, and you really need to be careful but lest you get tricked or, or trapped into to being more than you can really be. And of course in our case I don't think that we can be more than we can be because we are the second largest city in America. We are the capital of the Pacific Rim. We have, we have all the underlying attributes to, to make us be a convention center of, of a top magnitude. Um, but I do want to point that out. So we are not just talking about building a building, a bigger building. We're talking about a whole new approach to how we uh, deal with the convention center. And the first part of this report goes into some of that, that we've this council adopted uh, the governance ordinance, which basically changed the structure of how the convention center is governed. Went from an, uh, uh, an advisory commission to an authoritative commission. A lot of the functions now performed by, uh, uh, previously performed by the CAO, are now performed by by the department. Uh, we have gone to a private operator, AEG. AEG has now completed their first year of operating. It's gone exceedingly well. I think better than than our expectations. Um, we have a hotel development strategy, and I appreciate uh, uh, your comments today about the importance of hotels. I would ask you to look at page 7 just to, to take a look at how bad our hotel situation is compared to our competitors. Uh, we, uh, Ernie's going to get up and talk later about the need to desire to get to 50 million visitors by 2020. Um, we can't get to 50 million visitors by 2020 if we don't have a place to stay unless your living room is available through B&B. &B. Uh, we really need more hotels. Uh, and our situation with regard to hotels is really quite dire. Uh, uh, and so we have set a goal of, of 4,000 additional hotel rooms uh, by 2020. Uh, and on the page 8, it, it talks about the hotels we have, the ones that are under construction, uh, and, uh, and the ones that are, are, are hoped for. And, and as to the, the excellent point that uh, Councilman Krikorian was making about the size of hotels, in our area, 200 hotels is just too small. We, we, we don't like seeing a piece of property consumed by a hotel that only has 200 rooms because we need to get 4,000 rooms, and getting there 200 rooms at a time is a long trip for us. If I was in Burbank, if I was in North Hollywood, if I was in Pacoima and a lot of other areas, I, I would be happy to have a 200-room hotel. Um, the, I'm going to come back to that uh, page 9 in a minute, but look to page 11. Uh, I think it really shows how the situation we have with regard to convention center. You know, we want to be one of the top five convention centers in the nation, but here we are, you know, we can't even beat Houston. Uh, uh, so we just, we, we do need a, a bigger and more modern futurized convention center. And if you flip back a page on page 9, I think you can see the consequences of this. The fact that we don't have enough hotel rooms and we don't have a big enough convention center. You look at San Diego, one of our more prosperous suburbs of Los Angeles. San Diego has 75 citywide conventions generating 704,000 nights. San Francisco, smaller number of conventions, 52 conventions, but they draw the higher end conventions, the doctors, the lawyers, the you know the the, the, the really high end conventions. So they generate 852,000 room nights. Here we are Los Angeles, the second largest city in America, and we're sitting on 22 conventions generating 154,000 hotels. We are not even in the ball game, uh, and we're not in the ball game because we don't have enough hotel rooms and we don't have a big enough convention center, and that's what we're here to to be advocating. Um, the rest of it you you have seen before, talking about the design. You know, uh, you, you have authorized a design competition. 
three architectural firms have been awarded $200,000 apiece to do this design competition. Uh, we had a community meeting in January. The architects received their notice to proceed early in January. We had a community meeting uh, January 13th, I think it was. We have a kickoff meeting with the architectural firms on February 18th. So we are off and running. Uh, the, the architects will now have the three architectural firms will each be doing two designs, one with a hotel on site and one without a hotel on site. And we will have those designs ready for you to look at in June. Uh, so the AEG contract comes to an end, uh, uh, unless otherwise extended, on April 17th, and the design competition comes to your, your attention in June. Page 16, people always ask me about this, and page 16 and 17 just shows a comparison. It shows the two graphics of what, what the, what the uh, uh, campus looks like with a football stadium and what a campus looks like with uh, an expanded convention center. And in this case, on, on the bottom of page 16, we do show one hotel pad as a, conso a, a conceptual location of where a hotel might be, but it could be lots of other places. We have a big campus, and we could fit uh, one or two or three hotels on our campus in various locations. This was just a representation of one possibility. And then the graph on page 17 shows the different comparisons, what we are today, what we would be with Plan A, Farmers Field, and what we would be with Plan B, an expanded and modernized convention center. Uh, the next page, uh, 19, uh, talks about the schedule. Uh, let me just pause on, on 18. It talks about the kinds of conventions that we are not able to attract right now. Right now, our convention center and our hotel inventory makes us in the range that we can handle about 74% of all the convention market that's out there. San Diego, San Francisco, Anaheim can all accommodate 92 to 99 percent of the conventions that are out there. Uh, and not only do we therefore forfeit 20, 25 percent of the market because we're not big enough, that 20 to 25 percent of the market is the high end of the market. Those are the kind of the groups we listed here, the American Heart Association, ophthalmology, uh, groups like that, that 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 bring in the most people who spend the most money. So. We're missing 25% of the marketplace, and that 25% of the marketplace happens to be the most lucrative share of the marketplace. Uh, on schedule, uh, you know, schedules always bug me when you get to be my age. The definition of short-term and long-term and mid-term changes rapidly. Uh, so uh, the, the schedule right now uh, uh, has us uh, bringing the design competition to you in June. It would take about two years to do design and a little over two years to do construction. So we're talking about an opening in, 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 June, uh, in 2020. Um, once we get an architect selected, I would really like to tighten up these numbers. I think you know, being government bureaucrats, we always play it safe, and we want to be on budget and on schedule, so we have the budget be a little bit high and the schedule be a bit long so that we can look better when it comes in lower than that. So that schedule of 2020, you know, I would hope, particularly on the design side, could be tightened up a little bit, but we won't know that for sure until we get a chance to talk about to the architects. Uh, and then the, the uh, last section that I'll take your time with today is, is financing and our ability to, to pay for it. One of the beauties of Plan A is that Anschutz pays for it. Uh, one of the downsides is Plan B is we pay for it. Uh, and that's a big difference. Uh, it adds to the reason why we really prefer Plan A over Plan B. But then the question comes, you know, can we afford it? Uh, and what I've spelled out here is on a prima facie basis, and our analysis getting into it, we conclude that we can. Um, there'll be a sharper pencil taken to it when we actually have a design and we can get contractors and we can get pricing. But in terms of just a prima facie case, you know, we believe there's reason to support that, that we can't afford it. Uh, let me say that one of the things we've done to, to, to bolster ourselves up, uh, on that is we are directing the architects to to be prepared to do it a phased uh, approach if, if that becomes necessary. So I think it was on, let me look at the page that had the pictures of the two floor plans. Uh, yeah, if you turn back to page 16, if we had to phase the project, um, we would take the gap between West Hall and South Hall, the area over Pico. We would take the gap and, and build out that space, adding more additional space 
is our number one priority for the convention center. And then if we had to in phase two, we would remodel West Hall. Now naturally we'd like to have all $350 million and remodel West Hall for $100 million and build a new space for $250 million and, and do all $350 million up front. But if we can't do that, then the phasing would be we need the new space first and we would do the remodeling second. That's part of whether or not we can afford it, uh, is that we can phase it if we have to. The second part of whether we can afford it deals with our ability to pay. And uh, the city has a, as you well know, uh, a, a transient occupancy tax, TOT, rate of 14%. Uh, and of that 14%, uh, one percent goes to the Cultural Affairs Department, one percent goes to LATCB, and three and a half points go to the Convention Center Debt Service. Uh, and the remaining eight and a half percent go to the General Fund. Uh, we are in a, in a fortunate position that West Hall is totally paid off, and South Hall only has like eight or nine years to left to go on its bonds. So what we believe we can do is basically refinance it, keep our debt service to payment the same, but pull out enough equity to be able to build a new building, just like you might you know, refinance your house uh, and, and, and build a, a family room or, or, or a, garage, a swimming pool or something. Uh, uh, our commitment is to never come to you and ask for an increase of the TOT. The TOT is 14%. That's not super high, but it's the high end of what's acceptable in the state. And we would never ask for a bigger share of the TOT than the three and a half points that we currently get. Uh, if we wanted more than three and a half percent, it would have to come out of somebody else's hide, and that's not a, not a very uh, savory position to be in. So our commitment is that we live within the 14 percent, and we live within the three and a half points of the 14 percent that we currently get. We're in a boom, uh, again, with the economy. The hotels are running occupancy. Ernie might talk about it uh, in 80 percent, 90 percent. Uh, it's a great time to be a hotel, so we're getting a lot of TOT. If we are allowed to keep the three and a half percent that we have historically gotten by refinancing, we think that we can, uh, we have a prima facie reason to believe that we can support this. Of course, part of one of the actions you'll take when it comes back to you is to hire a financial consultant under the leadership of Natalie Brill here in the audience to really take a sharp pencil to that. But we're comfortable that we have a good starting point. So that's where we are. We feel good about it. Uh, the architects have a kickoff uh, on February 18th, and we will be back to you in June with lots of pretty pictures. Um, you made some passing reference to the privatization uh, uh, of the convention center. Um, is the consensus that has been favorable so far? Or what's, what's the uh, yes, sir. We believe it has. That uh, uh, we have uh, completed one year now. Uh, the returns we get from our uh, attendees uh, is that the convention center is operating as good, if not better, than it ever has before. Uh, we're actually doing crazy wild things like shampooing the carpets and washing the windows, things that haven't been done for years, you know. Uh, so the privatization has, has caused us to, to uh, uh, keep our clients happy and to save money. I think we, I think AEG put out a press release, we put out a press release, I think we, we uh, uh, the newspapers, I think, mistakenly referred to as made a profit of $3.3 million. I don't ever want to say we made a profit because then Miguel Santana comes and wants to sweep it and put it in the general fund. So we, so we, never, a term. <laughs> we never admit to making a profit, but we, we, uh, we do have revenues in excess of expenses, and that revenue in excess of expenses now allows us to do things like wash the windows and, and shampoo the carpets and pay for the staff of, of the small department that is the Convention and Tourism Development Department. So we've paid for the staff of the department, we've put more money into capital improvements, and we still have... Uh, 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 revenues in excess of expenses. You mentioned the, um, the Plan B uh, process that we uh, have something back by June. Yes, sir. Uh, you didn't mention um, uh, some kind of a process, a public process for reviewing, and I hope that you'll be able to factor that in. I think it's going to be a Yes, we have. We had, we had one. Public input, uh, into this yes, process. sir, we did. We, have one, we had one kickoff meeting in January to get input early on. And then when the plans come back, we have a series of hearings, and I forget exactly what the various locations are, but we're going to have 
the plans on display at City Hall. We're going to have the plans on display someplace at the convention center. So we are going to outreach uh, to uh, to make sure that the plans are readily available by anybody that wants to take a look at them. Uh, now, when we did have the one community meeting, frankly, we don't get the turnout that you might get if you're building a park or a library or a fire station. There isn't the, the neighborhood attached well, we'll to us. We'll help turnout on this. Yeah, board. but. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Yeah, it doesn't look like our NFL prospects are that bright at the moment. Are we even actively considering Plan A anymore, or are we just moving on to fully focusing no, yes, on sir. Plan we, B? We very much consider Plan A our preferred alternative. There's no, no. This report makes that very clear on page one uh, that Plan A is our our alternative. If there was anything we could do. We would be out there doing it. I think what we say here in the Is there nothing else we can do at Well, this there's point? nothing else that I can do. Uh, there's things that you can do. There's things that, 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 well, that, things that uh, I don't even know if there's things you can do. The city has done everything it can do. I mean, we're in an incredibly good position to think that we have uh, a certified EIR. We have a consummated business deal. We have all the entitlements in place. Uh, you know, this deal is as ready to go as any deal is possible, ready to go. And I read in the LA Times that that Inglewood is going to do certify an EIR and get all their entitlements and all their zone changes in 30 days. Godspeed. Uh, uh, but we have spent, you know, two years making sure that our ducks are in order. So we have done everything the city can reasonably be expected to do, unreasonably be expected to do. The ball is in the NFL's court. It's just. The bottom line is the ball's in the NFL's court. Okay. Well, the good news is the NFL set up a committee. <laughs> so any day now, I'm sure they're going to be ready to, to, to make a decision and take an action. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things, Mr. Overman. We've talked for years now about hotel capacity being a limiting factor for the big conventions. And in the, your chart here, you com make comparisons with other cities, uh, hotel capacity within walking distance. But of course, nobody walks in Los Angeles. Um, and the convention center has the unique advantage of being right next to the red line and the purple line and the blue line. So does hotel capacity in Hollywood and North Hollywood and other areas that are 15 minutes train ride uh, or 20 minutes you know uh, on the on the metro does that figure in to to this equation does, does is that a positive point or is that entirely irrelevant no, to yes, convention it's, yeah, it's a positive point uh, what i indicated early on is that in a, when when we started this we had 2335 rooms uh, uh, and we set a goal of getting to 4000 net new rooms by 2020 so we can get, if we really work hard, we can get to 7,000 rooms. But 7,000 rooms puts us still way behind San Diego, Anaheim, San Francisco. So what we have, and, and, and I, I'll bring the next time a, uh, a copy of our annual report. We have in our annual report the, the middle section called Transit Oriented Tourism, and it shows a map of exactly what you said. It shows the city's entire transit system and talks about how you can be going to uh, a convention, you can stay at Universal Studios and, and get on the right. red line and zip down here. You yeah. can stay in Hollywood, get on the red line. You can stay in Long Beach. We'd prefer you not, but yeah. you can stay in Long Beach, take the blue line and be here. So the convention center is at the, at the epicenter of the entire city's uh, uh, mass transit line. Every transit line this city has passes within four blocks of the convention center. Uh, 7th and Fig is mm -hmm. the furthest away. Uh, uh, and then when we have the Crosstown Connector, you'll be able to go from Pasadena on the gold line on one seat and get all the way to the convention center. So absolutely uh, transit figures into it. We have a much better transit system than people give us credit for. We don't have the culture of doing that yet. If you turn to the report in here that talks about the two cities that have fewer hotels within walking distance. If you turn to page seven, the two cities who have fewer hotels within walking distance than us are Chicago and New York, pretty good cities. And the reason they can do that is they have a sophisticated, matured uh, transit system. That's where we have to get. 
Um, you mentioned uh, the regional connector, um, and that brings me to another point I wanted to make on this. Uh, we've had this AEG proposal hanging over, you know, our heads for some time now, um, and we know that major conventions plan their schedule probably four years, five years down the road. I would imagine. Is that yes. about right? That's correct. So right now, if I'm a convention planner, I'm looking at 2008, 2019, 2018, 19, and part of 20, the convention center being under construction. So, and I'm looking at a regional connector project coming to downtown that's going to disrupt Figueroa and Flower and, you know, other areas around there. Um, it, it, is that hurting our ability right now uh, with conventions, just that indecision and the threat of construction, one way or the other, whether it's the AG project or Plan B, is that hurting us out in the marketplace? Yes, it's absolutely hurting us. There's no question about it. And Ernie's the next speaker up, and he can elaborate uh, even more. It's, it's absolutely hurting us. Um, these conventions, the big ones, rotate. East Coast, West Coast, North, South. Uh, so when they're looking at us and saying, boy, we're not sure what you're going to be doing in 2018, you know, we wish you the best of luck. We'll be back in 2022 yeah. and talk to you. It's just so easy in this competitive market. It's so easy to say, you know what, we'll just pass on you this time and we'll be back next time. For them, that's easy. Again, when you're my age, that's a lifetime. You know? So, uh, uh, so it, it is absolutely hurting us. But what hurts us even more is twisting in the wind and not knowing. Two years ago, we were saying, guys, we're going to make a decision between football and the convention center. And now here we are two years later saying exactly the same thing. So it hurts us to not have a decision made. The worst thing in the world for us is to continue to twist in the wind and not even know when we are going to have an answer. Okay. That's exactly so resolution is critical resolution uh, is essential final question you mentioned uh your commitment to staying within your allocation of the tot um that presupposes that the tot stay at the current level um and i'm not one of those that really believes that adjustments in the tot dramatically impact the marketplace but I would like you to tell me otherwise if it does. So oh, you mean example, raising the TOT itself? Yeah, if we were to raise the TOT, would that, how significant of a factor would that be in large convention planning, for example? Or would it be absorbed within the much larger issue of relative hotel costs? Well, I, I, that's a very good question. And, and what I said was that I would never recommend it. You know, uh, I might. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You know, so uh, I can't tell you, and, and again, let's see if Ernie wants to, to speak to it. I would have to tell you, if I was brought to the podium and asked the question, I don't think a convention center would, a convention would make a decision based on 14% or 15%. I just, Neither do I. I don't think they would make a decision based on that. I like, in the whole quiver of arrows that we have, to always keep our, our, our rates as low as possible. But if pressed, I would never tell you that they're going to make their decision based on one or two points. It's the best tax we have. None of our constituents pay it. Well, so. I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think Lane wrote a report called Out of the Pockets of Strangers, you know, and the beauty of tourism, the reason we promote tourism is that people import money. They bring their money from all these other states. They spend a lot of money in a short period of time, and then they go home right. before they need the police, the fire, the paramedics, the libraries, the parks. Tourism is a great economic engine for the city. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, bud. We'll receive and file. <laughs> Item 10. Item 10 is the discussion of the Los Angeles Tourism and Convention Board 2013-2014 Annual Report. Okay, we're joined by Ernie Wooden, CEO of the LA Tourism and Convention Board. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Wooden, the floor is yours. For the record, I'm Ernest Wooden, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Los Angeles Tourism Board, and it is truly a delight to be here today with uh, what I consider to be really good news that I'd like to share with you. Uh, for the fourth year in a row, Los Angeles has reached new heights of tourism that the city has never experienced. Uh, and in fact, uh, we announced in the early part of January 
the fact that we are now up to four, more than 43 million visitors to the city. And there's so much good news to share with you, but I tried to narrow it down today, uh, considering the time, to four major areas that I wanted to uh, update the Economic Development Committee on, uh, they being the uh, 2014 results, what we were able to accomplish, uh, our North Star goal of getting to 50 million visitors and why by the year 2020. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about city conventions because that's a heightened concern by a lot of us uh, as exhibited by the previous questions to uh, Mr. Overham. And I want to give you a little bit of uh, a marketing update which is a good part of the heavy lifting that we do around the world uh, through LA Tourism. Before I do that, though, I do want to thank the, uh, the committee for recognizing the role that tourism plays in the economic development of the city. Uh, many cities grapple with that concept. They think of it as a fun thing to do, folks going to the beach and things like that. Few world-class cities really understand that tourism is a trigger for major economic development. To give you some sense of scale about that, in 2013, which is the numbers that we have that uh, are finalized, we're working on 2014 as we speak, visitors coming into the city of Los Angeles directly spent with our hotels, our restaurants, taxi cabs, amusement parks, our uh, cultural institutions, more than $18.5 billion in one 12-month period. The economists tell me to fully understand what that means uh, in terms of economic impact. You've got to multiply that number by an econometric factor of about two, which says that those over 42 million at that point number of people that came to the city had an economic impact on the county of Los Angeles for a number that exceeds something over $35 billion in a 12-month period. So I share that with you to thank you and to thank this committee for recognizing the solid line relationship between tourism and the economic health and stability of this city. So 2014, some exciting news to share. Uh, for the first time ever, we reached 43.4 million visitors, over a million more people than we welcomed in 2013. Our hotels did a whopping 79% occupancy. This is incredible, this level of occupancy. Uh, it presents opportunities for us because it says that uh, most of the year, our hotels are completely sold out. In fact, to illustrate that some of our hotels, for example, around LAX, experience an annualized occupancy exceeding 90% for the year. Some hotels in Beverly Hills and on the west side uh, experience similar occupancies. Our hotels downtown experience occupancy well, occupancies well in excess of 80%. But as I said, that presents an opportunity for us as we think about the number of people that want to stay with us, spend those valuable TOT dollars, but can't because of the lack of facilities. I'd like to share with you a little show and tell. Uh, on January the 6th of this, uh, of, of, uh, this year, uh, the mayor called a press conference to celebrate the fact that uh, we had reached this uh, zenith goal and to also celebrate that LAX is now the fifth busiest airport in the world and in terms of passenger count, the second busiest airport surpassing jumping over Chicago in the United States, second only to Atlanta.
provided more than $18 billion in direct spending to the LA area in 2013. Spending money on hotels, uh, on transportation, on food, beverages. It's with great pride that I stand before you today. Proud of this city, proud of the city family, and everyone that helped us get to the point where we are today. President and CEO of our Board of Tourism, Ernest Wood, here. He gives me an update, and I remember when he said, yeah, we're going to have 50 million people, and I'm like, yeah, right. And LA tourism experts say even more people are expected over the next few years. We're well on our way to reaching our North Star goal of 50 million visitors by the year 2020. Trying to get to 50 million, we've got a lot of work cut out, but I know we're going to get that together, and I want to thank him and his team for their extraordinary so, Mr. Chairman, we've mentioned that we want to get to 50 million by 2020, and that's not just a vanity goal for us. There are significant economic reasons why that number was cho chosen and why we've plotted that course. If we get to 50 million by 2020, that will mean more than 2.3 billion, 2.3 billion incremental dollars over what we're doing right now if we get to that number. More importantly for this committee, it will mean that we will drive more than 102 million incremental TOT dollars to the city's coffers, 102 million dollars on the back and the octane of tourism. And of course, jobs are most important. Getting to 50 million will, be, will uh, translate to 31,000 new jobs simply on the back of the tourism statistics. So getting to 50 million is an important goal for us. But there are things that we must continue, and this committee should consider as we think about that goal. There are certain things that we will do naturally, and our visitation will go up naturally. There are some things, though, that we've got to really redirect our efforts and our thinking and our commitment of dollars toward. Uh, one we've spoken about extensively in the earlier presentation, and that is the modernization and the what I'd like to describe as the futurization of the LA Convention Center. And by using the word futurization, we are very sensitive to whatever monies we put in to fix some of the obvious issues at the Convention Center. We must, at the same time, equally consider what convention, convention planners will need, not today, but 20 years from now. Uh, simultaneous translation booths, for example. Uh, technology that may not even exist today, but uh, which are being planned by uh, companies that do that kind of thing. Google and others come to mind, BMW, others come to mind. So we're going to be thinking about that as we think about investing those dollars. Important that we get that done, the modernization of the convention center. Much has been discussed about hotel development. There is no doubt, and I will say that again because certain people harbor this point of view, there is no doubt that we need more hotel rooms. Uh, our internal research says that by 2020, in order to facilitate 50 million, we will need in the county not less than 7,000 more rooms than are currently planned. In and around the convention center, we have a North Star goal of getting four to 5,000 more. But as Bud said earlier, that will only take us to about 7,000 rooms. We'll still be behind our major competitors in Anaheim, in San Diego, and significantly behind San Francisco. But new hotel development is something that we must have, and we have to find a way to get there. Uh, we need to continue doing all the good work that we're doing as a city now in terms of public transportation we've spoken about. Uh, these things are critical. Last year, we welcomed almost 7 million international visitors to L.A. International visitors expect public transportation. And to illustrate that, all you have to do is go to 42nd Street and 8th Avenue in New York and see the Germans and English pulling their, their bags up uh, uh, 7th Avenue, going to their hotels, having gone from JFK Airport to the 42nd Street Cent Grand Central Terminal in three stops. That's what they expect to do, and we are well on our way. Uh, we've got plans to do that. We need to continue on those, uh, those efforts. The next phase of the LAX uh, renovation is important. We've got to be considered a world-class uh, airport, as the Tom Bradley International Terminal is today. Uh, but the revitalization of the various uh, parts of the airport and the people mover that will connect to public transportation, we must finish that. 
And we must continue to encourage urban and uh, entertainment development. Think Harry Potter at Universal Studios, which is going to have a huge impact on our visitation numbers. But I'll include things like the Broad Museum, the uh, retail outlets uh, that the Rakovich companies are doing downtown now at the Macy's Plaza, uh, the work that we're doing on Broadway, and possibly a uh, connector, a bus connector, or a trolley connector to connect all of our cultural uh, places with our convention center. Those kinds of uh, projects encourage tourism and they will uh, provide the necessary uh, fuel to get us to 50 million. I want to talk just briefly about citywide conventions. As you know, one of the charges of the convention, the, the LA Tourism, uh, through our selling arm, is to sell the convention center in its current state. And so I want to uh, confirm to you that we are very sensitive to the barriers uh, that are in front of us in the short term, uh, both in terms of uh, the development of the transportation issues that we've got to work around, as well as possible renovation of the convention center. These things are important. There's going to be some headache while we go through that, but I prefer to think of these investments in the long term. We may, uh, and we have developed short-term strategies to work around those hurdles. We've already employed those. So if you look at this chart here, it talks a little bit about the conventions that we have on the books right now and that we're constantly adding to. The strategies we've adopted, for example, we've attempted to strip out all of the conventions that would be highly sensitive to construction and to think about those kinds of groups that would be less sensitive. They may be smaller, they may be shorter term, uh, but they may not be as influenced by the whole campus uh, being uh, renovated at one time. We might be able to put them in one hall, for example, while the other hall is being connected or worked on. So we've been employing those strategies. Right now, this year, so far s since June, we've had great success with that. We've put almost 194,000 rooms on the books over these periods going out to 2025. I would share with you that we're now booking conventions, over 150 conventions, uh, having an economic impact of over $2 billion out to the year 2030 as we speak. So people are making long-term decisions about us, and they are encouraged that we, are we won't be, as Bud appropriately put it, twisting in the wind after a certain period of time. But we've got to get to that point we've, where we've got some definite uh, plans uh, in the hopper. But I share this with you to give you some sense that we are very much in the convention center business, that the work that we do is very good reason to believe that the TOT tax is safe <coughs> and growing uh, because of the occupancies that we're driving in the hotels. Uh, we sell more than 28 million hotel room nights. Uh, you can see by this about 300,000 of them are convention room nights. But the work we do to market the city broadly is what is uh, behind the large TOT contribution uh, that we're able to make. So we have reason to be confident that that is going to continue uh, and grow. Uh, LA is constantly reinventing itself, and we are so appreciative of that. It makes our job easier as we market the city in, uh, around the world. Uh, and I wanted to share with you, recently we had a very high-level customer advisory board come into the city and talk about what's different about L.A. And uh, we don't get to talk to these people often, but I thought I would share a little show and tell about what they're saying about L.A.
convenience of getting into the area, like right into LAX. Um, you're able to go to so many different cities and experience so many different adventures. The biggest change for me is the airport. I love the fact that they've just undergone some major renovations because that's always been a bit of an issue for me and bringing the groups into help. I wanted to cut it off right there, but I wanted to share with you what our customers are saying about us. Uh, we don't get to talk to them often, at least not in this setting, but I wanted you to hear firsthand, people love L.A., they want to come to L.A. So although we're going to have a few bumps in terms of the renovation and the transportation over the next couple of years, long-term, big meeting planners that bring thousands and thousands of people want to come to Los Angeles. One of the important things that we do at the Los Angeles Tourism Board is to market the city around the world. Uh, we host more than 300 uh, press junkets a year where we bring uh, international writers to the city. We take them around the city, show them what's going on. And last year, we were able to get them to write about us to the tune of over $50 million of earned media. That's media that we have not paid for but media that, where they write about the exciting things that's happening. And I put four things that were really exciting this year that we accomplished uh, uh, in this earned media area. Time Magazine listed LA as the best new restaurant destination, not in the United States, in the world. And Time Magazine. Food and Wine Magazine called LA the America's best new food city. The Guardian newspaper out of the United Kingdom you're familiar with them. They've been around since 1868. They uh, funded an uh, uh, independent study of the best branded cities in the world, and Los Angeles came in first over New York, over Paris, over Tokyo, uh, over London. Uh, it was incredible, and these were folks that we entertained when they came. It was an incredible accomplishment for the city of Los Angeles. And GQ magazine this year said that downtown Los Angeles, and if you put yourself in the mind of 10 years, 15 years ago, uh, this is really an incredible set statement. They said downtown Los Angeles is America's next great city and the coolest new downtown in America. So we are delighted about that. Uh, and it's not accidental, it's through the work of this committee uh, and its efforts to drive economic development that, uh, that we're able to accomplish these things. One of the important things that we do in this world uh, of digital uh, uh, media at the Tourism Board is we communicate with our world audience through social media uh, and through our websites. And I'd like to share with you that this year we've been the recipients of four major uh, uh, tourism uh, Digital Media Awards, the Pixel Award for the Best Tourism Website, Webby Award, the Smitty Award, the Skift Award, all saying that as social media goes, Los Angeles is one of the, if not the, top city in the world. We've had 10 million visitors to our discoverla.com website, 53% more than last year. We have 1.3 million social media friends. That's Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. There's only one other city in the world that has over a million, or until last year, some of them are paying for it now. We don't pay, but that was Berlin for some reason. Uh, China, 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 extremely important to us in China. Uh, the uh, Facebook over there is called Weibo. We have more than 1.5 million people that track what's happening in Los Angeles because it's an aspirational destination. One day, they're going to go to Los Angeles. They want to know all the hot stuff that's going on. They've signed on to track us. And every time we put something out, they want to be the first to know. The, we've heard of the WhatsApp application. It's got world renown. In China, it's called WeChat. And we have a robust footprint in China where folks write us, ask us questions about what's going on in LA. We have a whole team of people in Beijing that respond to those hundreds and thousands of tweets to us every single day. I said that we're running 80% occupancy, uh, but we do have some slow periods. Uh, and so we have developed several marketing promotions, our LA museum season, our winter in LA to promote our museums, our Discover the Arts program, and these programs invite people to come to the city. Many of them are local, somewhat local, from San Diego, Phoenix, for example, San Francisco. They spend thousands, they uh, occupy thousands of, of room nights and spend, of course, millions of dollars. 
And most of all, I'm proud to announce that 2015's advertising campaign, which we're now able to do because of the tourism marketing district that you oversee, Mr. Chairman, uh, we just launched it last week. It's a $4 million campaign. Uh, it uh, will, you, you won't see it here in L.A. because its intent is to bring people from outside of L.A. in, but it's launched in New York City, Chicago, and Seattle, digitally in San Francisco, San Diego, Phoenix, and Sa Sacramento. Uh, it's four major ads, uh, and internationally we have outdoor advertising in China, which is a very important destination for us, uh, Australia, digital advertising, and Canada. And I thought I'd share with you, if you can see in your packet, what some of that digital advertising and outdoor advertising looks like. In New York City, the first one uh, is a billboard right in Times Square that says, your LA story is waiting. That's the theme of our advertising campaign. We ask people, what's your LA story? And I can share with you that people come back with incredible stories of their memory with LA, of things that have happened. So we ask people, what's your LA story? Your LA story is waiting. The next uh, one that I showed you, uh, this is a kind of uh, sneaky thing we did. It's working really well. This is the bus terminal in New York City, where we say New York City is right now 25 degrees or something like that. If it's over 70 degrees as it is today in LA, uh, it will say LA and our temperature. So let's see, New York City will say 20 degrees and LA it's 78 degrees right now. And thousands and thousands of people write us to say that's unfair. <laughs> We do the same thing, believe it or not, in Chicago. Uh, a digital uh, board that if, we, if it's lower than 70 degrees, it simply says surfs up or something like that <laughs> in LA. But if it's over 70 degrees, we actually put the current temperature in LA. In China, the People's Square Metro, this is a metro station uh, where we have these large 10 foot long by 8 foot tall billboards, 900,000 people a day see these billboards at the People's Square Metro uh, going on as we speak right now in Shanghai, China. At our airport, the Pudong uh, Airport in Shanghai, uh, you see uh, we've got eight big uh, signs that you can see on the next page throughout the airport, the International Terminal. Uh, and then we have bus wraps on the 200 city buses in Shanghai, all talking about uh, 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 Los Angeles, and that's how the Chinese speak of Los Angeles, Los Angeles. And to, uh, to, to demonstrate the importance of China to our market, and by the way, one of three Chinese visitors coming to the United States comes to Los Angeles. It is truly aspirational. And I thank the, uh, the uh, chairman, along with uh, Councilmen Bonin, uh, Buscaiano, and Cedillo, uh, for traveling with us and the mayor uh, on a trade mission uh, late last year. And I've got some pictures. Uh, that you can see of the good work that we did encouraging with more than 80 of our top business leaders uh, in China to consider investing in China and more importantly to come and visit us uh, uh, in Los Angeles. And our councilmen were really hits over there along with our mayor. Uh, we launched medical tourism which we have a, we are, uh, promised is going to have huge uh, um, impact on our visitation numbers. Uh, our new initiative for 2015 we're very excited about is we are now doing neighborhood videos of more than 38 neighborhoods. Uh, I think that each of the council members will be very pleased that LA Tourism is shooting 90 second videos in every neighborhood in the city of Los Angeles. Those 90 second videos um, will be on our website in addition to over 100 uh, hotels where we're shooting 90 second videos uh, and we're doing this very elaborate website mapping on our on our site now so that you'll be able to take your your uh, your computer and hover your your uh, what do you call that your pointer over a neighborhood and click it and you'll see the if it's Silver Lake or if it's Hollywood you'll see an entire presentation about it and then also the hotels in that neighborhood will show up you can click that hotel. You'll be able to walk through the hotel and see all of the things the hotel has to have. Has it so people will be able to make around the world. Uh, they'll be able to have an intimate experience with coming to uh, to Los Angeles. And in conclusion, uh, I would be remiss if I did not uh, give a shout out for what will be the largest uh, sporting event in Los Angeles in July of this year, July 25th through August the 2nd. 
The Special Olympic World Games will bring 7,000 athletes. This is the biggest sporting event that Los Angeles has uh, had since the 1984 Olympic Games. It's even bigger than the Olympic Games in terms of participants. 7,000 athletes, 30,000 volunteers locally, 14,000 family members will be coming in with these athletes, coaches and invited guests. There'll be a half a million spectators. This is going to be a huge driver of tourism for the city of Los Angeles. Again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you on behalf of the more than 120 marketers and direct salespeople we have working on behalf of the city of Los Angeles around the world for inviting us to present this good information, uh, this wonderful information about the impact of tourism on the economy of Los Angeles. Well, thank you, Mr. Wooden. This certainly is a uh, very encouraging report, and I'm uh, excited to see the, uh, the efforts are paying off uh, under your leadership and that of your team. Um, these uh, little 90-second 90 uh, 90 vignettes are interesting uh, as we start to expand our discussion of cultural tourism. We know we've talked about that uh, on many occasions. How do we um, introduce the rest of the city to the to our to our visiting uh, to our visitors from around the world? So, how would they, you say they're going to be on the website? How else do you see these uh, little vi videos being used? These vignettes being used? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, we are very, very sensitive to all areas of our city. We are not uh, focused on downtown. We are the tourism authority for the entire city and for the county, for that matter. Uh, but we're very sensitive to making sure that all of the jewels of, and hidden jewels of the city of Los Angeles are available. Uh, some of the things, some of the strategies we're deploying, for one, all of these uh, district uh, videos or neighborhood videos will be available to all of our hotels in the city. So if you go to a hotel, you'll typically see a hotel channel. You'll be able to see on a continuous loop uh, these stories about what's happening in that particular, uh, and the hotels will have all of these 38 available. So I imagine that some hotels will have three or four of them around their general neighborhood on their continuous loop. Uh, we will also make these, uh, these videos available to other uh, NGOs, for example, other groups uh, that uh, BIDs and others that will use them in some of their promotional things. Uh, these are all paid for. They're high quality movie style videos. I, I wanted to bring one, but I was afraid of, that I'd run out of time. But I can certainly do it in the future. But we will have all of those available to whomever we want as we join hands to promote the city of Los Angeles when we travel around the world, around the globe, and, and locally. Any questions? Any other questions? Mr. Koretz. So in, in terms of the convention center and the hotel rooms, um, how much historically and how much currently do we try to connect with larger hotels and clusters that aren't necessarily that close to downtown like places like the Century Plaza in terms of trying to get shuttles and other, other less high-level transit methods but ways to get them in the mix? Uh, constantly. Uh, that, is, uh, that is a primary selling tool of ours is that unlike what most people think, we have a robust uh, tr mass transportation system. So our, our folks that are selling conventions constantly are showing what that looks like, that it's easy to get to Hollywood, for example, from our convention center. But earlier there was a little bit of uh, discussion about this matter of walking distance to the center. This is an industry standard metric that's looked at around the United States and around the globe, basically. Uh, folks will get on public transportation, but they prefer not to. And so the industry standard is how... And I'm not even talking about public transportation having to find a bus. I'm talking about shuttles for special conventions where they try to book you know, X number of hundreds of rooms at the Century Plaza, and they have several shuttle buses that are there at the right times. Yes. Um, have we tried to do that kind oh, of constantly. transit? Very definitely. Uh, and, and you'll see large conventions that employ those, those kinds of things. Anime, for example, is an example that use, where they use large bus transportations to get to a route because of the unavailability of 
walking distance hotels. So yes, that's an incredibly important. Many of the members of LA Tourism's board are transportation companies, and so we include them when we bring out, oh, about 500 customers a year that are thinking of us for conventions. We include those transportation companies and people like them in trying to bid on those pieces of business. And, and as far as getting hotels built downtown, um, Number one, do we have to provide TOT subsidies? Any chance they can get built on their own? Um, where, where are we in that? Are we, are we negotiating with companies? Are we getting them successfully to start making plans? Yes, uh, uh, Councilman. My, my background is primarily hotels. And I will tell you that the hotel community is very interested in being in Los Angeles. What we've got to understand, though, is sometimes penciling a hotel so that investors are willing to put the many millions and millions of dollars that are necessary to build a first-class hotel in. Sometimes there's a gap between what a normal return on investment might look like by itself uh, and what their own internal rate of return or hurdles are. And so often cities around the United States will step in and provide a little bit of cushion to help these developments pencil. So in specific answer to your question, yes, uh, the city must consider ways to induce, even though the hotel companies want to be here, and private developers, we've got to figure out ways to get them to develop here and not in other places like Chicago and Austin, Texas and things like that. And oftentimes that turns on how rich a package they can throw into the financial model uh, to, make, uh, to make their own internal rates of return. And a question I'm, I'm not sure I really want to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, I believe the city at some point in the near future will uh, add a significant increase to the minimum wage. And whether it may well be focused particularly on, on a higher rate for hotels. Uh, we're told by some that that is likely to make it very difficult to attract new hotels downtown. Do we think that's actually the case, or do we think that we still can attract them uh, if we take that step? Well, I, I will say uh, for the record that LA Tourism is a marketing organization, and not, uh, we, don't do, uh, uh, we don't take positions of advocacy. Uh, but I will I'm say... trying to get your sense. I, I know it's a, a little bit of a political hot potato. Your informed sense. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Yes, so uh, I will say that demand for Los Angeles is very strong. Uh, and I expect that that demand is going to continue to be strong in the foreseeable future. Very good, thank you. Questions? Questions? Yeah, just a couple. Mr. Um, first of all, love the videos. Can we get those? Absolutely. Uh, because I think you know, some of us would like to post those up ourselves on our own uh, social networks. Um, the uh, and ha I guess we'll just I'll have my staff follow up with you. But on the um, one of the good ideas that the 2020 commission had, there were a few. Uh, one of them was this idea of joint marketing um, for tourism among you know regionally and with the state and so on. Have we made any progress in kind of trying to bring everybody onto the same page with our marketing efforts? You know we have, and uh, it's not widely known, but uh, LA Tourism has been at the forefront of bringing the smaller destination organizations in and around the city uh, to our offices to consider opportunities to joint, to joint venture in some marketing efforts. And we've been doing that for the last several years. Uh, you, you, you must know that in some ways, usually when it's closer in, we are competitors. So mm -hmm. in Santa Monica, for example, they may be competing for groups to drive their TOT taxes. So in that area, there's probably less of a chance for us to coordinate direct selling activity for customers. The further away we get from Los Angeles, though, the opportunities get bigger and better. When we're in China, the Chinese have no idea that Santa Monica is not part of LA. In fact, someone thought that Las Vegas said to me, they thought Las Vegas was part of LA. But, but uh, they don't have any sense that we have 80 cities in Los Angeles County that kind of thing. So there's opportunities, and we have found opportunities. For example, uh, because we're the 300-pound gorilla, we have a big website presence, social media presence. And some of our smaller brethren, if you will, in Santa Monica, in Hollywood, in West, in West Hollywood, uh, in Beverly Hills, 
have uh, come to us and have uh, shared in some marketing activities because we have the footprint. So we're already doing that kind of thing. Uh, and we regularly search for ways of doing it more because collectively we want people to come through LAX uh, and we want them to impact LA County. That's where the 50 million comes. And we've had some success at that, but it's in the area of marketing generally, not direct sales for the obvious reasons. Well, and on the direct, direct sale, well, not. In, in a lot of cities that I've traveled to, you can buy a, you know, Paris Pass or something, whatever they, they might brand it in a particular city, that for you pay a fee, and for that fee you get admitted to five of the, you know, best attractions in the area, something like that. Have, do we have something like that? We do. In fact, that, uh, that uh, cultural slide that I shared with you, it brings about 80,000 room nights a year. Uh, we, we do that uh, twice a year. It's called our museum pass se uh, 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 season. We try to do it when there's a little bit of a trough for hotel occupancy. And uh, we have more than 40 museums that around the city of Los Angeles that are part of it. And what you do is you get like a $400 pass uh, just by staying three nights in a hotel, and you can go to any one of those uh, museums. But, but that's something a little different. That's a hotel marketing uh, tool. I'm talking about just you, you show up here, you go to some place, you buy a pass for $40, and it gets you into these different things. Do we have anything like yes, that? Yes, we don't currently have anything like that. I'm familiar with what you're describing in Paris, France, for example. Uh, they have something like that, and just San recently... Diego has one. And San Diego, yes. We recently talked about uh, doing something like that with the Getty Foundation just a month or two ago. That's kind of evolving. Okay. And then, uh, lastly, you made a point about um, because we have to plan ahead so much for scheduling conventions, we have to anticipate what will the convention planners of the future want in our convention center. And um, it, it occurs to me that in, the, in this era of rapidly um, evolving technology, uh, it, it may be the case that within our lifetimes there will be no more need for conventions because of advances in information technology and real-time, you know, multi-person gatherings and, and those sorts of things. And I'm wondering if, you know, if there's any risk that we're making big investments in, a, in the buggy whip factory of the future. I don't, I don't believe we are. Uh, the first time I heard that argument uh, uh, was in 1977 when uh, the technology got to the point where we thought that meetings would stop because the technology for meetings was now evolving. That's the first time I heard that, that, that question, that argument. Uh, we believe then and we believe now that the reason we uh, have conventions is more than simply the sharing of facts and information. Deals are done at conventions. Uh, it's the lifeblood of economic growth when people shake hands, when they know people, uh, when they get to sense things that they couldn't get in an email or looking at a television screen. That's why people meet. So at the end of the day, my answer is, I think there's little chance, very little, I could be wrong, but very little chance uh, or risk that conventions will stop or that we'll build the buggy factory of the future. Uh, we've got to have those facilities for people to come together. Uh, we've got all the things to make that a desirable uh, a, a human activity here in Los Angeles, and I think we've got to prepare for that. If I may uh, contribute to that, uh, one of the things that we've learned on this architectural competition, design competition, we've had you know, uh, convention center architects from all over the world come and, and talk about what, what the convention center of the future is. And one of the things that struck me is the emphasis they're putting on more intimate socialization, that the big exhibit space, the million square feet of exhibit space, isn't as important today as the meeting room, as the ballroom, or as the just uh, sitting arrangement that you have in the lobby, where four or five people can walk out of that meeting and sit down and, and make a deal. So, so all of these people, as we do the convention center, the convention of the future, will be much more oriented to 
socialization. That is why people come, is to interact with people. And we need more couches than we need exhibit halls. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And, and the technology, by the way, is going to lend itself to that kind of thing. So that the social media technology, where when I get to a convention of 7,000 people and I have a particular interest, I'm going to be able to find those people that have the same interests or curiosities that I have uh, through the technology. So we have to think about our ability to adapt that technology to those social setting reasons why people are coming. Thank you. Good. Okay, well, again, thank you for... Uh, I have one more question. Uh, it just occurred to me, because I know we had this discussion when we were looking at making changes at LAX. Um, what's the cap of the number of passengers we're supposed to have in LAX in a given year? So, so if we make this increase um, in the number of visitors, will we actually drive ourselves above that cap? And uh, should we be looking at whether there are ways to move some of those folks to other regional airports as we have been talking about and not doing a very good job of for decades? Have, have we taken all that into account as we've done planning for this expansion of the number of visitors? and? conventions that 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 uh, that calculation is not part of our 50 million growth effort uh, but certainly that's one of the things that the city must grapple with uh, because we will get to 50 million visitors by 2020 and we need to grapple with uh, not only hotel accommodations but airline or airport accommodations transportations all of those things that accommodate that number of people, because we will get to 50 million visitors. And I know when we had that discussion, you know, the neighbor said, well, you're not making these changes for safety. It's because at some point you're going to lift that cap and drive you know, millions of additional visitors through LAX. And I think the council made a commitment to, to not do that. So we really have to be looking at, if we're going to honor that commitment, um, driving some of those additional visitors somewhere else, otherwise we're going to blow right through it, is, is my fear. So I hope if, if we're not thinking about that as part of this whole process, I hope we add that to our, to our planning process. Well, in Ontario, our port surely has room for them. Well, those Bob those are, Airport. Those There's those more <laughs> hotels in North Hollywood. <laughs> those will be happy Which problems. I use regularly. <laughs> those will be happy problems if we have to figure out how we're going to divert. Uh, those are great problems to have. Those, that, those are good problems to have. Well, thank you, uh, uh, gentlemen, for uh, for the for both reports. Uh, appreciate the uh, the update on the uh, on our convention, um, our ability to attract visitors here, uh, and fine work the bureau is doing, and. and expanding the, uh, the LA brand and, and, and bringing those visitors home. And we look forward to working with you as we uh, continue to find the best ways to do that. Thank you. So hopefully we can get an update to say about six months. Absolutely. Give us an update on where we are and how, how close we are to our goals and objectives. It's always good to appear when there's good news. Great. Thank it's you. An outstanding good. report. Thank, Thank you. Very good. Hey, members, any other business this time? No, sir. No, sir. Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. All right. Thank you.